Welcome to the RD2B podcast. Each week we sit down with a different registered dietitian nutritionist to showcase the diversity of opportunity in the dietetics profession. Our aim is to dismantle the notion that there is a traditional career path. I'm Carl Barnes, the registered dietitian behind the scenes of RD2B. And I am Jenna Warnock, the RD2B host. Our RD guests share their stories, career paths, and advice to help students like us succeed in the profession. Welcome back to another week of the RD2B podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jenna Warnock, and this week we're super excited to, after a bit of a hiatus from featuring some people within the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we're super excited to feature none other than the current president of the Academy, Dr. Lori Wright. And so Dr. Lori Wright, she's going to just kind of discuss her role within the Academy and really just kind of clear off some cobwebs of how RD2Bs, students, or even new dietitians can get involved with the Academy and just revitalize this really great organization that can bring dietitians together, especially in this very transformative, changing, like very much um, evolving field at the current moment. And so Dr. Wright, thank you so much for joining us to just talk about your experience and also the Academy as well. Perfect. It's so good to be here and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really excited to just kind of share your experience, your perspective, and just everything that's kind of bottled up into who you are and who that is within uh, the dietetics profession. And so first, just kind of going back to the beginning of, you know, kind of the question that we like to ask everyone is, why dietetics? What inspired you to go through dietetics, pursue dietetics, all that good stuff? Well, I um, was a a chubby kid, and uh, when I was um, late in middle school, I embarked upon a a weight loss journey, and I didn't do it um, in a healthful way. I was very uneducated. It happened to be that I was in health, and I'd already started this journey, and we learned in health about calories. And I was calculating my calories and realized that I was consuming like less than a thousand calories. Um, And, you know, so I learned how important good nutrition was. And uh, and then I was also an athlete. And so that I I noticed even when I reached my weight loss goal, um, I still wasn't eating healthfully. And I, you know, I would not perform as well in in my various sports. So, um, you know, just I and I could never get enough. I read everything there was about about nutrition and um, but never knew there was a field. I'm a first generation college student, so I never knew um, my my dad, you know, you're going to college, you'd be a nurse or a teacher. That's all he knew. but I was in, so I, I loved healthcare. Uh, I um, it was in my sophomore year of nursing when I took a nutrition class and I went up to the professor and said, this is so amazing. Is there, is there like a job you can do within this? And she, she told me about becoming a dietitian and the rest was history. Oh, and that's, and I think your story definitely resonates with a very, you know, it's, it's definitely Mm -hmm. not to say that your journey isn't unique, but it's mainly just the concept of you're not alone in a lot, you know, none of us are alone whenever it comes to our upbringing and dietetics, because you starting off with saying I was a chubby kid, I was just like, yeah, no, same, you know, because it's just Uh (laughs) like, whenever it comes to just the inspiration with dietetics, it's great knowing that, you know, it started so early in the sense of being exposed to it and then having it flourish in a positive way. Cause I mean, we all go through our trials and errors, errors sure. with nutrition for sure. And it's great how you had that professor kind of gear you towards the direction that you really wanted to go with nutrition. And so after your um, undergraduate studies, you know, and you get that RD credential, where did you see yourself flock to in dietetics was, you know, clinical community kind of, where did you see yourself fall under? Well, especially when I was a new dietitian, um, I interned at the VA hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, while doing my master's at Case Western Reserve. And uh, so I was very, um, and at the time, you know, you really had three paths. You were either clinical, you were food service, or you were community. And, And training in the VA, I definitely went very clinical. I was very clinical. And so I was fortunate to um, get a position as a general medicine dietitian 
at the Tampa VA hospital. Um, and so a good, you know, many, many years, I was very clinical. I, um, I specialized in infectious disease. AIDS was, um, a, 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 you know, a, an epidemic at that point. And I was in it before the, you know, the heart therapy, the highly anti-retroviral therapies came into place. And so we were dealing with malnutrition and wasting. And, um, and then the new meds came along and um, we started seeing other different challenges like diabetes and heart disease. So, um, you know, I, I really loved my, my time as a, as a clinical dietitian and, 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 you know, certainly working in, in HIV. One thing I just absolutely love about this field is I feel like I have had multiple careers within the same profession, right? So I was a clinical dietitian for many, many years. And, and I always knew that one day I wanted to be um, a professor, an internship director. That was, a, that was a goal. But there was a difference between the professors that you had that had practiced and those that hadn't. And I never wanted to be one of those dietitian or professors that, you know, all they knew was the book. So, um, so I, you know, I, I was clinical and then had the opportunity to start a dietetic internship at a sister VA in um, St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, and so I kind of finished out a 20 year career in the VA as first a clinical and then an internship director. Um, about that point, when I finished the 20 years, I also finished my PhD. Um, and then it was time to go into academia. And um, I teach to this day, I, my favorite classes to teach are um, medical nutrition therapy. And, you know, and I, I have stories, I have cases I, that are real. And, um, and I really, um, you know, I think that's the clinical dietitian in me. And then like kind of the internship directors are very much about applying what you learned in the classroom. So even when I'm in the classroom proper, I'm always trying to get people to apply it, you know. Um, so I just feel like I've had like these amazing different opportunities within dietetics. Um, as a professor, I early, um, early in my time as a professor, I went back to look at nutrition and HIV and it had changed tremendously. It had gone from malnutrition, wasting hospital care to outpatient. It's a chronic disease now. Um, and they're dealing with other chronic diseases too. And when I, when I was working in this clinic, I found that the number one issue that they were dealing with was food insecurity. And it was a tremendous problem because if they didn't have enough to eat, there were certain meds that they couldn't take. Um, and so then they, they wouldn't, take their meds and then their, their disease wasn't as well controlled. So that really changed my trajectory. I really moved into public health, food insecurity and the health disparities that um, occur as a result of that. So, um, I mean, who has that kind of, I mean, like, and then there's a, like the dessert in my professional life is the global work that I do. Um, so I've been traveling um, you know, really kind of focused on malnutrition and different parts of the world, but primarily my focus, um, and I actually, um, my husband and I lived and worked in Ghana, West Africa for a half a year. Um, and, you know, that, that is just to me, has just been the absolute dessert of my whole professional mm -hmm. life. Yeah, and I think it's just wow. And the you described it so great how dietetics is such a great profession where you can have so many different hats and so many different careers technically yeah. under the same career. And so in what you said about the difference between having a professor who has, you know, years, decades of experience and taking it to the classroom compared to one who just went straight through a PhD and straight to academia, how much it shows, it's a great I feel like that's a great thing to take note of, especially with the shifting of graduate degree requirements and how now there's a talk of maybe people getting just straight to a PhD or just kind of the talk of those. Yeah, exactly. Just the yeah. talks of just going straight to the top. But it's great to have that insight of take a step, just kind of see 
the benefits of first going out there, not touching grass, you know, and like that sort of like sense, but, you know, just kind of really getting to have those real case scenarios or just being able to apply before you can actually apply it to a classroom. Because I'm like me alongside, I'm sure a lot of my other peers, I am interested in getting a PhD, but it's also like, what would that serve me in my current like phase of life and things like that. Whereas like, do I, you know, am I in the situation where that would benefit me most? Whereas, I mean, we could see in your example, you had a very robust clinical um, kind of background and experience that helped you tremendously as a professor when that time was right. And I think your experience in dietetics shows a great progression of kind of taking advantage of that time and experience and then having it grow into you living in Ghana you helping on a global level but it all starts with like don't try to you know don't try to do everything at once all at the same time or else you won't be able to go doing those big great things and I think it's a great reminder for everyone especially just in you know the master's degree requirement there's a million different ways you can become a dietitian now and it's just kind of like oh well let me just do it's just kind of everything piling on top and can get overwhelming but it's just a great reminder that like things have their time things have their place and it's good to take things slow because then you'll get to that global level of you know maybe if you want to travel you can get to traveling and I can I can just hear with how you talked about it how fulfilling that time in Ghana was and um, this is just a curious question on my end is whenever it came to that global level how did you transition to that opportunity and how did that like opportunity present itself i tell everybody um one of my biggest uh, uh, pieces of advice is really when opportunities knock go for it don't don't hesitate just go for it and so i had um i had had i'd done a a a study abroad with students to Belize and at the time um, it was it was the um the the side of Belize that is right by Guatemala so it was a it was a poor area at the time it's kind of exploded now but um but it was a poor time so that was like my first um foray into like international experiences and um in what was really um quite intriguing about that experience is um, I was at the hospital with the um, program that we were doing for the the interns and then I heard the administrators talking about they had just opened the second dialysis unit in the whole country at that hospital it was right out front and I said well do you have you know like do you need any information about nutrition and so I ended up really helping set up the nutrition component of it um you know in my time there and so it's just that opportunity you know um i after that took the interns to a dietitian giving a lecture at the uh, on pediatrics and she was she had all these pictures of work that she had done in the dominican republic um i mean for years she had been going once a year um, to the DR to work in a malnutrition clinic. And I, and I went up to her afterwards and I said, this is just amazing work that you're doing. I would love somehow to, to partner with you. And she said, well, I'm going next month. Would you like to come? And I said, yeah, I would. (laughs) And I went and, you know, it, and it just, I mean, it just, changes the the trajectory of of my of my whole career and you just don't you don't want to be afraid to say yes Uh, um i always tell interns and dietetic students that um when i applied for dietetic internship i did not get i was waitlisted this was before diecast and things so they they waitlisted you and you waited all day for someone to turn down a spot that you pray that you got a spot and I didn't. So I went through the match and I didn't have an internship. I had a very good GPA, I had good work experience. Don't know exactly what happened, but um, I didn't match. And and I think that's so important for people to know um, because um, 
you know, I, I was, I mean, I think I'm a pretty good dietitian. It just didn't work out for some reason, but there was a different path and, um, I didn't give up. So I, I was going to reapply and I got a job as a diet technician, um, over the summer. And in August, I got a phone call from the sister internship. So I had applied to university hospital in Cleveland because at the time I thought I wanted to be a pediatric dietitian and um, the VA hospital in Cleveland had um, an opening last minute. They had an opening. They said the internship starts next week. You were, you were, you know, on the high on the wait list. Would you consider, would you like to come to our internship? Yes. I went for it. You know, I mean, you know, sometimes it's scary. I mean, I had to move, you know, two and a half hours away. Um, but I mean, it, you know, I went for it and, and I just truly believe that those are those, those pivotal times of your life can make or break your, your experiences, you know? Yeah. And I think it's great because I feel like a lot of people in dietetics were just very calculated, very like, Ooh, should I do this? Should, you know, it's kind of like analysis paralysis in that sense where it's like, I need to flush everything out before I say yes. But I feel like in the most, like, like with what you said, the most pivotal moments you say yes. And then you figure it out later or as you go along, because that's really where, you know, the growth comes from. And typically, and this is something that I heard from someone before where it's like the the more scared or nervous you are, the better it is for you in the long run, I feel like, because then that means that it's, you're truly going into an area of growth. You're truly going in a direction that you need to go into. And I'm sure, I mean, just with you saying yes, even though you'd have to move in like two weeks time, um, that puts you on your path to the VA hospital in Tampa, like settling in, you know, starting that dietetic internship in Florida, and then just like kind of having everything spiral into you on a global scale. And so I think it's it, like those types of decisions are great because they compound over time into these great, beautiful things. One as well being you president of the academy and just making an impact in that area as well. And so I think we have like just a great foundation of just what you've done as a dietitian and just how you've been able to really make the most of our profession because we're definitely in an area where we're trying to make our voices heard more. We're trying to have more represent representation in the like healthcare community and just as a profession as a whole. And so I kind of want to talk more about the academy, how we can use it and just also how students can use it. And so first kind of going into what made you feel like you were ready or felt the desire to uh, not apply, but to kind of run for president of the academy? Like, where did that all begin? <laughs> so um, um, my dad was, um, he is a retired police officer and he was actually very involved in his organization, the Fraternal Order of Police. So I grew up um, going, our summer vacations were where the conferences were, you know, and um, so, so service uh, was kind of like, I grew up seeing service, and, um, and so when I became a dietitian, I, of course, I joined the, the district, the local um, association, but very early on, um, I was at Tampa VA, they had an internship, I was a preceptor, and I talked to the internship director and I told her, you know, I, I want your job one day. <laughs> and she's like, well, you're not getting it anytime soon, but I can help, you know, I can help open doors so that that'll build your experience and everything. So she recommended that I become a site visitor for the accrediting body ascent. And, um, and I, you know, so my first volunteer experience was at the national level with Ascend. And what I want to tell people is that um, it's really important when you think about volunteering, think about what volunteer experience is going to benefit you as much as you're going to benefit the academy. Um, because, you know, I... 
I got so much out of that volunteer experience. I learned every time I did a site visit, I learned about, you know, really great things that programs were doing. Um, and I would take that back to my hospital and share, but it also helped me. So when I had that opportunity to become an internship director, I was ready. I was so trained. I knew exactly what I was doing. And I had this amazing network of dietitians, dietetic educators. So if I like, I don't quite understand an activity that'll fit this competency, you know, I just reach out to my network and, you know, and we shared and it was wonderful. And I, to me, the, the, the great, absolute greatest benefit of this organization is the networking. It's, it's that connection piece. Um, it helps you, you know, it helps you with your work. It, I'm an extrovert, obviously, so I, I love also that, you know, those personal connections. But um, I just can't tell you how, how much that network has helped me. I remember when um, I started the second, second practice doctorate program, um, the DCN at University of North Florida. And, um, you know, when you're building classes, you you at that level these are all experienced dietitians so they're going to that advanced level now and so you've got to challenge them and a textbook isn't going to do it so what i would often do is i would have i would reach out to my network of friends that were here's the expert in um uh intestinal transplants and that dietitian, you know, would give a lecture and maybe just share a case study for me. So, you know, it was it was just that's just one example of you know how my, my, that network helped me. But I always encourage people to again volunteer in something that's going to help you and 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 then also share your skills. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is cliche. I, you probably get tired RDs to be get tired of hearing this but you know you guys are so good like at social media and things like that if let's say and I have an intern currently that's very interested in renal disease and so she's volunteering with the, the renal practice group and she's helping them with their social media presence and so she's giving her talent but in turn she's already with immersed in the area that she would like to specialize in one day and has the opportunity from that network to do a specialty rotation with one of the renal dietitians in the group so you know this is a, it shouldn't it shouldn't be about it's not just like work you know it's not an extra thing you've got to do it's it should be beneficial to both sides and that's what um, that's what makes our academy go around, and it's when you think about it, like the RD to be. I think you might relate to this, Jenna. Is like you get so much from that, and the academy is the only professional organization that's one hundred percent dedicated to nutrition and dietetics professionals. You can specialize in nutrition support and be a member of Aspen, but Aspen is made up of nurses and doctors and pharmacists and that's great but the academy is the only organization that is 100 dedicated to us right and provides help at every level so there are all kinds of benefits as a student to uh, you know uh, you know access to the journal and the evidence analysis library but um uh, but also even leadership opportunities for students. Do you want to be a scribe for the House of Delegates? Do you want to be a student liaison? So, you know, the I really feel that the Academy meets us where we are. So even when you're registered and everything, that next level, that next level of, of benefits and, and staying up to date on, on all of, you know, your continuing education, specializing, having those specialized credentials, um, you know, it's just every level and it continues to meet my needs, you know, I, I mean, yes, I've been in this a long time, but still like for their leadership development and everything. So, you know, that's, to me what's so important that this organization is for us 
And you all are our future. Um, you know, as corny as it is, you are our future. And I'm doing my best to move this profession forward. So it's going to be even more magnificent for you all in the future. But we need you help. We need you to be a part of us. Tell us what you need, what you want, what you dream for in our profession and help us achieve it. The Academy isn't a they, it is a we, you know. That like truer words could not have been spoken, especially about the Academy. And I love how you highlighted that the Academy, we meet you where you are. Like, it doesn't matter if, because I've been a member and I didn't know this whenever I was at community college, because I did community college first. I wasn't in a DPD program. I, di I didn't start at a traditional four year. I didn't know that you could be a member in, at, at a community college level. I like my first year, so my first year, I was just like, oh, I'm not, like it didn't count. Like that's kind of, how, that, that was the feeling I had. But then again, it wasn't until I started volunteering with RD2B. And again, it was like that symbiotic. I love RD2B so much, not just because I'm servicing the profession, I'm servicing others or things like that, but I have gotten like, compounded so much in return and one of that was just knowledge of the academy and just knowing how helpful it is and how helpful it is for students but like I want to say the first bit of information I got was because whenever I was talking to Carl about it I was like yeah I mean but I just have to wait until I get to my four year and then I'll be a member and he's like what no yeah he was like <laughs> just just do it and I was like huh and so um so it's just like those little things where it's like you want to hike again and it's like it's similar to what you said your goal was as president and things like that is to uplift to just kind of dust off those cobwebs and to make all the great resources aware because once I became a member it's like you see these dietetic practice groups these member interest groups these different committees you can be on the ways that you can volunteer like for example with the social media like we have Chelsea she's with rd to as well and she found rd to be through social media and whenever Carl mentioned DPGs she's interested in diabetes. So she joined the diabetes practice group and she has become like at the forefront helm of their social media. And she is like an absolute go-getter. And now she has that great network now just because she took advantage of the academy meeting her where she was and where her interests were. And I think it's really great to highlight those things, not only for like, oh, you only get benefit once you're registered. It's no, it starts before, even before you're in a DPD program, it can start when you're at community college or when you're doing those prereq classes. Like it really, like that was definitely my first eye-opening experience with the Academy and the great things that they can offer. And so kind of continue talking. I will oh, say, yeah. like, no. just, um, you got me thinking we more, yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, one of my favorite roles, volunteer roles that I've had um, is as an academy spokesperson. So I was a spokesperson for nine years doing media interviews and social media is so powerful. And we see all the bad that's going on in social media, but dietitians, it's a way, because I became a spokesperson when I was, had moved as a professor. So I wasn't getting that direct, direct patient care anymore. But what I felt like, as a spokesperson is that I could put sound nutrition out there to consumers in a, in a sexy way that would get them motivated and interested. And we can amplify the voice of dietitians if we use social media correctly. And, and when I talk about meeting us, meeting dietitians where they are, that's one thing that um, we just a couple weeks ago had a free webinar for members that um, explained all the FTC rules around social media because your viewers may or may not have heard we had a couple dietitians that um, got their hands slapped by FTC because it wasn't that they weren't that they were trying to do something wrong. It's just that the rules changed and sometimes um, they get confusing. And so we had this webinar for, for members that um, it really explained the ins and outs. We had um, a very experienced um, social media diet influencer, dietitian, and we had two attorneys too. And, and that's available on the website, um, on the eatright.org, so that you can 
again, amplify the voice of dietitians, but do it in a way that you're not going to get in trouble. And, you know, and then you're doing, you're providing good to consumers. So, um, you know, I love that about, about the Academy. Yeah. And I just want to note how, again, like how you said the Academy is the most up-to-date and 100% like invested into nutrition and dietetics professionals how quick the turnaround was where you saw what was happening in the media, like with those dietitians kind of not, you know, with how confusing FTC can be and everything, you guys did a quick response of this is something that we saw as an issue in the profession of, you know, the kind of muddled FTC guidelines and knowing how we can follow them appropriately. You guys just turned around and was like, boom, free webinar with three very experienced and well-knowledgeable people on the subject. And um, it's just like those types of things. I feel like, especially in dietetics, like, or just within the academy, those great resources are kind of just swept under the radar and they're just not really highlighted. Like, for example, um, my MNT professor, I love her so much. She is a member of the academy and she pulls any resource from the academy that makes sense, that like applies to our class. Like she uses the evidence analysis library. We have to have the ENCPT manual for our MNT class. And it tells you how to write a PES statement. It just it, it tells, you know, it just tells you and it guides you through the whole process and like those things I did, I was not really familiar with, but again, it's like, if, if you look at where you're currently at within your dietetics journey, and then you go to the like Academy website, you will find something that will meet your needs, or you will find something that will help you along the way. And I think it's really great that, again, we have these interviews or we just have these ways to uplift and just remind people of what the Academy can do. And whenever it comes to your current role as the president and what you've seen, especially on your end within the Academy, are there any um, gaps or just things that you have seen either from the student side or the professional side that you have a goal of filling or that you kind of have a goal of just clearing out and uplifting, like with what you said, your goal was to push us forward into a better direction. We are at a a crossroads really in our profession, in my opinion, with the Medical Nutrition Therapy Act um, and the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. Um, We also have an interstate um, compact for licenses among dietitians. We've got all this going on and it's the academy is advocating for this. And and sadly, you know, all those advocacy efforts, if we get this reimbursement covered, you know, that benefits members and non-members. It it benefits everybody, you know. And you know, right now in the 1960s when medicare was deciding who are providers and what would what would be reimbursable we were not at the table we were not at the table and so currently we get reimbursed under medicare for diabetes and for a pre-dialysis the mnt act uh troa the treat and reduce obesity act that will change this forever and it's always my goal that in, in years to come, when you are a dietitian as long as I am, and you're going to sit back and talk to a student and say, you know, when I was an intern is crazy, but we didn't get reimbursement. And, but we all banded together and we got this pass. And now we can provide this level of care and get reimbursed. And, and I, and I, want to say that, I mean, getting reimbursed for our services is amazing. That's what we need, but it isn't just about us. It's about your grandparents and the lady down the road being able to access medical nutrition therapy. We know the power. That's why most of us went into this field. Um, But there are so many barriers to be able to access that medical nutrition therapy. MNT will open up that access. And you know, the lack of access is what contributes a lot to the health disparities that we have in this country. And so that, you know, there is a, you know, a a professional financial, you know, part of this, but even more so for the good of of our fellow Americans is to be able to open up that access to medical nutrition therapy. So here's the gap. We need to all be working together and we need to answer those action alerts. 
we need to, um, you know, put this across on social media because M and T isn't just dietitians. I mean, you know, like your your parents could, you know, advocate for M and T too, um, and you know, as I just spoke with a um, a physicians group, um, a, a, a newsletter that they have, and. I was just interviewed about this Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. And what we're really saying is all these new anti, this new class of anti-obesity meds, um, when you start a patient on those, also refer to a dietitian. You can't have bariatric surgery without a seeing a dietitian. You shouldn't be starting those meds because they have some significant side effects and they, they're all, of always going to work better if you work with a dietitian, but there are side effects that we could prevent too. So, you know, I, and I, and most physicians, they want to be able to do that, but we've got to get some of these bills passed so that patients can have that access to, to m and Yeah. And I think it's so great that you highlighted that too, because shameless plug, I'm on the uh, ANPAC committee, like the political action committee within the academy as a student representative. And one of the things that I did was I wrote like an article for the student scoop about action alerts and about things students can do to help bridge that gap that you mentioned. And also that like with what you said, those acts, it's not just going to benefit members of the academy. It's going to benefit all dietitians, also everyone who is on Medicare or Medicaid. And also to do those action alerts, this is something that I learned with my role on the committee is you don't have to be a member to fill out an action alert or you don't have to be, you don't like with what you said, like my parents can advocate, anyone can advocate and the academy has direct links for whether you're a member or not to advocate. And it, it takes like maybe 20 seconds it's because they because yeah. because they, they do everything for you all you have they to do is it, they make it easy for you and and some people go what is a bunch of emails going to mean and i always say it's like it's like a radar screen the more blips you see to the legislators and their aides that's like ooh are my um constituents are are interested in this i i need to look at this um so that's the first way to get their interest and then often it'll open the doors for us to have a conversation with them, whether it be in um, DC or locally. And that's, you know, that's where we really make our progress. Yeah, and it's like those, like even just those conversations can lead to what makes the bill passed or can lead to those really big, huge decisions that will impact literally everyone in the profession. Because another thing too is like, I'm sure students are just like, oh, but it's just for dietitians. I'm not, you know, like it, the reimbursement doesn't affect me. It's going to affect us in like, <laughs> no, yeah. Like, and also with how we know long, like we know how long it takes for these bills to pass by the time that it would be in would be when we're practicing dietitians and when we would most certainly be the ones affected by it. And so like, I think it's great. It, it's also great to highlight that policy doesn't, mean you have to be into politics because the thing being is I I have absolutely like zero opinions whatsoever about the current political climate but I applied to be a student representative for the ANPAC committee just because one it's good to it's good to know knowledge is power in that sense and also like again you want to take advantage of those positions to not only you know benefit you but also benefit the community like you want to spread the word and with me in that experience it's you can be so withdrawn from political opinions, but still be involved in policy in the sense that it'll positively impact everyone. Like the MT Act literally has no negative. There's no it's it's either increasing access or no act, you know, like still limited access. Like it's very easy to see which one's the beneficial for literally every party. And so just whenever it comes to, you know, bridging that gap within policy. It has nothing to do with whose side you're on, who's what, who you think should be what. It's really just, it's the common courtesy of everyone should have access to MNT and whether or not we have enough people doing an action alert to, uh, you know, show that they agree and that. things like yeah. that. And so it's just so important that we just bring this up because, and also just distinguish it from 
all the other crazy stuff happening that you know yes. we're just we're just focusing you know exactly you can focus on just the stuff that matters in dietetics in the sense of increasing access and all those things which is super important and um whenever it's it comes nonpartisan, oh. right it's not yes. part and it mnt is low cost high value um we can prevent so much and manage so much um for very little when you think about it mm-hmm. yeah and As like for, uh, you know a bypass surgery you know? no exactly like be, and another thing too is like the list of what the mnt act would also cover is like so long like groups for two things versus i know it's over 20 different things that that mnt act would cover which is insane because we're because like with what you said even with your experience of seeing your treat like seeing the research and stuff on hiv and aids at the beginning it was very acute malnutrition it was very much hey treat what's currently going on and now it's shifted to a more chronic disease lens it's similar to mnt it's definitely shifted from just mnt in general it's definitely more preventative rather than of, of course there is a sector for acute maintenance of course there always will be but the majority of what america needs is chronic disease management or chronic disease prevention above anything else and the mnt act would directly address that and so for dietetic students out there you can absolutely be involved as a student and we do of course like everyone should be a member of the academy but you still can participate and advocate even without being a member but that's not to say disregard the other great benefits of being a member of the academy because it's really I mean we kind of touched base on just a handful of things but really it's just a never-ending resource library and um yeah and so don't oh yeah you attended um fantasy for the first time and Mm -hmm. I remember my first FENSI just to graduate it and started as a dietitian. And it was just like, oh, I mean, all these famous people, these these cutting edge presentations. But, you know, it was like like seeing these thousands of people that we all spoke the same language. I mean, it was like an instant like you could see them in the in the elevators, right? Or the hallways, and you would know that they were dietitians. And you just, you know, you just felt this kinship. That's what membership is about. You know, I mean, it's us working together. This is your all's profession. You, you need to start as a student so that your profession is what you want it to be. And and you know, it it, it saddens me when you have dietitians that are like, well well, we don't get this and we don't have that. Have you, have you been a part of the solution? You know, I mean, cause it's, it's just every other volunteer and us working together, trying to do this, we can use more, more of our kinship to move this forward. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Fancy because yeah, with uh, this past October being my first one, it was completely eye-opening. Like, and it was so, cause I mean, almost 10,000, it's almost 10,000 dietitians crammed into a little convention center and just the every like everywhere you saw it was just dietitian dietitian and it's and again it's like you could have those conversations or talk about these things that you really can't talk about with it's not like it's a reserved conversation but it's more so like you could go off the walls and they'd be like yeah 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 like it would just be you know like they would understand what you're saying and just kind of sharing and collaborating and I've made so many the amount of hands you shake the amount of people you talk to like I remember that Saturday I because I'm an introvert, like I, you know, I am very selective with my social interactions, but I was literally like fired up for about 10 hours just for that Saturday, because I was talking to everyone shaking, but it was all enjoyable. But by the time I, you know, I get back to my hotel, I'm like, oh, I just talked to 55 people today, (laughs) you know, like caught up with you, but it was such a great feeling. And um, hopefully you were at the opening too. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was all, just good vibes all around and everything which again it's like people can still get that experience within the academy and also a lot of things are virtual too like I'm glad that like we're mentioning that too is fancy like the food nutrition conference and expo that's once a year big huge thing but like getting involved with dpgs getting involved with your local state affiliates most of that's virtual I mean they have their yearly 
and you know their annual meeting as well but most of the time it's like virtual you know like all the resources are virtual and most of their meetings if not all committee meetings are on zoom so it's like you can get involved in a very flexible way and also you can do the action alerts on your own time you know like there's just so many different they provide a bunch of different avenues that you can not only get involved but obtain your resources and just have a constant tap into like the most up-to-date resources, which is really great. And so like the Academy has adapted very well to just like what's been changing, the new things popping up. And um, it's just been like, it's definitely been an adapting organization with all the changes that have been popping up. And so whenever it comes to what, you know, you've done in your role and just the things that you've learned within the Academy, is there anything, um, and this might, I'm, I'm not sure where this question can go, but whenever it comes to your previous experiences, because you had such a robust experience going into being president of the academy, is there anything you wish you knew or just things that you knew prior that really helped you to being president? Because you did talk about being a site um, visitor for Ascend, but maybe are there any skills or just things you wish you knew going in or things that really helped you going in, just kind of getting a better idea of the skills that helped you or would have helped you within the academy? I think having such a, a variety of work experiences, but also volunteer experiences, because um, as I said, I volunteered as a site visitor and eventually was on the accreditation council. Um, I was a state president. Um, and after finishing up a state president, I that's when my passion for public policy and advocacy was really fueled. And so I was fortunate to serve on the legislative um, uh, and public policy committee, um, you know, spokesperson, but, you know, uh, I was a delegate and then became the speaker of the House of Delegates. So I had such a variety. Um, I think one of the main things I haven't done is I didn't do um, the Commission on Dietetics Registration, but um, that variety helped me because, you know, and so many different committees and things that helped me so much. Um, but we are uh, another very exciting time is we have a new um, a new CEO, Dr. Wailisa Wiggs Harris, and um, she is so so talented and such a visionary. And, um, you know, she has been an incredible partner as we're visioning what, what this new, you know, where we want to go as an academy. And, um, and, you know, I had the fortune to go to a, um, a conference on more leadership. I, you know, I, I've, I've really, really try, I'm trying to continue to grow my leadership skills. And I mean, I teach leadership, <laughs> but yet I, I really felt that I needed to continue to grow my, my leadership skills so that, you know, that I can be this partner of, um, with uh, our new CEO and, and, and really do the best by the academy that we possibly can. And, and help her be successful. No, definitely. And I think it's great to recognize because and it's great that we're pulling from different ideas of if you see an opportunity, take it, but also make opportunities if you see that you're not lacking, but if you see spaces or gaps that you could fill yourself yeah. in to kind of enhancement. <laughs> exactly. Yes, enhance and things like that. And it's it's the great balance of if things come to you, you know, kind of knowing when to say yes and things like that. But also if you're like, hey, I would really wanna learn more about that, kind of getting the balance of both so that you can truly maximize your experience. And yeah, and so again, just so many great conversations about the Academy, your experience in the Academy. And as we're wrapping up and just wanting to really hammer home student involvement and just kind of what students, how students can feel a part of the Academy, how students can, continue their involvement even once they become a registered dietitian and so just kind of with like the final ending note of if you can like point students into directions that can maybe get their feet wet or to just kind of get them started on the right track of being not only involved in the academy but long-term involvement so that they can continue because I do feel like one thing too and we're seeing this with a lot of practicing dietitians is 
they're stopping their memberships. Like they've been members and then now they're just dropping it off. And so kind of painting the picture so that students know where to go, but also promote that longevity as members even after. So, so again, it's not just saying, oh, keep paying your dues, paying your dues. No, it's how can they continue that educational investment? How can they take advantage of the academy resources? Just final thoughts or pieces of advice for students so that they can help long-term. Yeah, well, you know, uh, tomorrow is um, National RDN Day. And um, I know that I still remember as a student, you know, like writing my name and then writing RD next to it and that I couldn't wait to be at that point. You know, you're passionate about this field, about about, about helping people. And um, one of the best ways that we can support you is through membership and, and the academy. And it's not just paying your dues. It's about, you know, again, us helping you at every step of your career to stay evidence-based, um, grow those leadership skills. Um, and banding together makes us more powerful. And, and it amplifies the dietitian, what the registered dietitian nutritionist is. And we just want to keep, keep growing our wonderful profession. And I, I think this is a very exciting time in, in the history of our field with the opportunities for, for um, reimbursement and expanding medical nutrition therapy, a new CEO. Um, you know, we're learning to do business differently by pivoting. We learned the, uh, so many great lessons and how we can be more relevant to, to our, our members. Uh, so it is a very exciting time, but we need you and you will benefit more than you give. I always have felt that in anything that I've done. Um, so help us be come together and help us be part of the solution and making our profession better. You know, and like, I think that's just such a great note to end on. And just knowing that you do get more out of it than you give, especially with the note of you get what you put into it. And so if you look for those resources, if you kind of, if you take a deep dive into the Academy website, see all the things out there, you'll be able to see just what resources they have, what things pertain to you as a student, new dietitian, seasoned dietitian, and just again, see how the Academy can service you where you're at. And so thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for sharing your perspective as president, your hopes for the future, and just ways that students can get involved. So we really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. It was a pleasure.